Good afternoon. Thanks uh, for waiting. Sorry for being late. We had a vote uh, that started a bit late. Uh, during today's legislative hearing, we will consider four bills. S-2783, Mikatsuki Reserve Area Amendments Act. S-3406, Technical Corrections to the Northwestern New Mexico Rural Water Projects Act. Taos Pueblo Indian Water Rights Settlement Act. And Amodit um, uh, Litigation Settlement Act. S-3857, Hamul Indian Village Land Transfer Act, and S-4365 Veterinary Services to Improve Health in Rural Communities Act. S-2783 was introduced by Senators Rubio and Scott. The bill would amend the Mikatsuki Reserved Area to include a tribal residential area known as Osceola Camp into the Mikatsuki Reserved Area and authorize $14 million for activities to protect the camp from flooding. S-3406 was introduced by Senators Lujan and Heinrich. This bill would authorize uh, approximately $18.5 million to, in back interest payments into three Indian water rights settlement trust funds benefiting the Navajo Nation, Nambe Pueblo, Powaki Pueblo, San Ildefonso Pueblo, and Tesuque Pueblo, and Taos Pueblo pursuant to their ratified rights settlements. S-3857 was introduced by Senators Padilla and Butler. This bill would transfer into trust status approximately 172 acres currently owned in fee simple status by the Hamul tribe, clarify the applicability of federal law and regulation to those lands, and prohibit gaming activities under the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act on those lands. As 4365 was introduced by Vice Chair Murkowski, this bill would authorize the Indian Health Service to support public health veterinary services to prevent and control rabies and other zoonotic disease transmission in IHS service areas. And you can tell my staff wrote this because I would never have written the word zoonotic. Uh, before I turn to the vice chair for her opening statement, I would like to extend my appreciation and welcome to our witnesses for joining us today. And I look forward to your testimony and our discussion. Vice Chair Murkowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate today's hearing. Uh, you've given a good rundown on the other bills uh, on the uh, agenda, but I want to speak to S-4365, which is our veterinary services to improve public health in rural communities. It would authorize the Indian Health Service to offer public health veterinary services, including spay and neuter services to tribes to help reduce the number of stray dogs in native communities. The overpopulation of stray and abandoned dogs in Indian country is a significant public health and safety issue. More than 250,000 reservation dogs, as they're often called, roam the Navajo Nation alone. I've introduced S-4365 because Alaska Native children experience the highest incidences of hospitalization from dog attacks than any other group in the nation, and we need to deal with it. According to IHS data, an average of 4,800 tribal members are hospitalized or receive outpatient care from dog bites each year. Some studies indicate that tribal areas experience a death rate from dog attacks that is 35 times higher than the rest of the nation, and most of these cases are either in Alaska or on the Navajo Nation. Even a non-fatal dog bite comes with serious emotional, economic, and public health costs. Dog bites can, of course, transmit rabies, parasites, and other zoonotic diseases, and I'm with you on the zoonotic diseases. I think we get rabies, right? Parasites. Um, but they, they transmit diseases to humans and unvaccinated animals. Medical treatments can be terrifying for children and elders, often involving significant time away from home and a series of painful rabies shots. Under current law, the IHS lacks sufficient legal authority to carry out veterinary services directly or in partnership with a tribe under a 638 self-governance agreement. And we know that because at least two we know that because at least two tribal organizations in Alaska tried to add veterinary services to their multi-year funding agreements, they were denied by IHS. So my bill would address this gap in health services by amending Indian Healthcare Improvement Act to state clearly that public health veterinary services are an authorized service of the IHS. And that way, these services can be included in a tribe's funding agreement under ISDIA. The bill would also allow the IHS to assign veterinarians commissioned by Public Health Service Commission Corps to IHS service areas where rabies are endemic. Note, there is no requirement that IHS assign such officers. It only authorizes it as yet another tool in the toolbox when we absolutely need it. 
Dogs have significant historic and cultural ties in Alaska Native communities. Individuals and families depend on their dogs, and when that relationship becomes distressing or disturbing for any reason, like a rabid dog in a village requiring all of the dogs in the village to be euthanized, it can be a source of great trauma. So we've got to get some help here. My office worked with a number of tribal members and organizations in drafting this, and I'd like to recognize one person in particular for his efforts, and that is Donald Charlie. Don is a former musher and a tribal leader of Nanana Native Village. He pushed for passage of three resolutions by the Alaska Federation of Natives calling attention to the lack of veterinary care in Native communities. Don's leadership on this issue helped us produce a bill that is supported by organizations like the Alaska Federation of Natives, Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium, as well as the American Veterinary Medical Association. This is a common sense piece of legislation that ensures the federal government lives up to its trust obligations while providing a humane, non-lethal option for animal population control. So I'm looking forward to hearing from our witnesses today uh, on not only my bill, but on those of the others before the committee. Thank you, Vice Chair Murkowski. Are there any other members who would like to make an opening statement? Senator Lujan. Thank you, Chairman Schatz, Vice Chair Murkowski, uh, for your thoughtfulness and for bringing us to this hearing as well today. I'm especially appreciative that this hearing includes my legislation, the technical corrections, the Northwestern New Mexico Rural Water Projects Act, the Taos Pueblo Indian Water Rights Settlement Act, and the Amat Lit Litigation Settlement Act. Between 2009 and 2010, Congress enacted several water rights settlements which included the Northwestern New Mexico Rural Water Projects Act, Taos Pueblo Indian Water Rights Settlement Act, and the Amat Litigation Settlement Act, benefiting six tribes. These settlements are part of the federal government's trust responsibility to providing water to tribes and to pueblos. While the enactment of the settlements is vital to ensure that the Navajo Nation, Taos Pueblo, the pueblos of Nambet, Tosuke, Puaki, and San Alfonso have access to water the enacted settlements included an unconventional prohibition preventing the Department of Interior from investing the trust funds from the settlements before specific dates. This prohibition on investment resulted in tribes and pueblos missing out on interest earnings that other settlements enjoy. This legis legislation presented before this committee will authorize $18.4 million for the three water settlement trust funds to collect interest that they are owed from their enacted settlements to complete much needed water infrastructure. This will help us fulfill our trust responsibility and promote water security for tribes and pueblos as well as non-tribal users in New Mexico. I appreciate the willingness of the Department of Interior in working with me and my office to address prohibitions impacting the settlements from being able to fully see the potential of the funds. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today and working with the chair and vice chair on moving this legislation forward in order to bring these much needed resources quickly to the communities who most need it. Thank you for the time I have. Thank you, uh, Senator Lujan. Um, I will now uh, turn to our witnesses. We'd like to introduce the Honorable Melanie Ann Agoran, Assistant Secretary for Legislation uh, at Health and Human Services. Uh, Mr. Jason Freihagi, uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Management at the Office of the As Assistant Secretary uh, for Indian Affairs at the Department of Interior. The Honorable Talbert Cypress, Chairman Muskogee Tribe of Indians in Miami, Florida. And Senator Padilla, would you like to introduce uh, your witness? Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And, uh, thank you, uh, Vice Chair uh, Murkowski, for the hearing today. I'm honored to introduce Erica Pinto, the chairwoman of Jamul Indian Village in California, who will be testifying today, albeit uh, remotely, uh, and to also welcome the several members of the Tribal Council who are in the audience. Uh, Ms. Pinto proudly serves as the first woman elected as chair of the rule since 2015. She's been involved with the Tribal Council for over 23 years, having first become a council member at the age of 21. Her leadership extends well beyond the tribe, however. Uh, Ms. Pinto also serves as tri on tribal advisory committees for the Departments of Health and Human Services and the Interior, where she advises federal agencies on intergovernmental responsibilities and obligations. She has consistently led on efforts to improve tribal health care and to bring additional focus to the missing and murdered Indigenous peoples crisis. 
As Chair One Ms. Pinto has led the tribe through significant economic progress on their path to self-reliance. She grew up with her three brothers on the Jamul Indian village and Bihas reservations, where she witnessed firsthand the hardships her people faced. Her mother was also a very active in tribal government for several decades, uh, and so her uh, leadership and commitment to serve the tribe should come as no surprise. Now, S-3857, the legislation before this committee today, would place approximately 172 acres of land into trust for the benefit of the tribe. After years of sacrifice in their efforts to achieve self-determination, the Jamul Indian village deserves a true homeland to preserve their sacred history and bring together their community for generations to come. It's been an honor to work alongside Chairwoman and the uh, entire tribe uh, on this uh, as we seek uh, not just to permanently safeguard their home, but uh, maintain their rich history and traditions for future generations. So I want to thank Chairwoman Pinto for her leadership and for her testimony today. And Mr. Chair, before I close, I'd like to make just a brief comment to Deputy Assistant Secretary Fujaj. I want to thank you for your testimony today and the BIA support for this legislation. We've been in touch with the Bureau also on several tribal gaming applications submitted by tribes in California, and I'd like to formally request that the BIA hold in-person consultation with the impact of tribal governments who have weighed in on these applications but have been unable to meet with leadership at the Bureau or the Department here in Washington in person to discuss their concerns. It's imperative that the Department meet with these tribes and live up to their tribal consultation commitments. And with that, thank you again, Mr. Chairman, for this hearing. Thank you, Senator Padilla. Vice Chair Murkowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to introduce uh, a witness that is joining us virtually from Alaska. Brian Lefferts is a commander in the U.S. Public Health Service Commission Corps. He currently serves as the Director of Public Health at the Yukon Kuskokwim Health Corporation in Bethel, Alaska. This is a tribal nonprofit healthcare organization serving 58 communities in Southwest Alaska. Commander Lefferts has spent 18 years with YKHC, serving several positions, working on a wide array of public health issues, including disease investigation, population health management, nutrition, and environmental health. I'm looking forward to his testimony on S4365 and his insights on the real world impact of animal overpopulation and the risks of rabies within our rural communities. Thank you, Vice Chair. We'll now proceed to our testimony. We'd like everybody to confine their remarks to five minutes uh, or less, and we'll start with uh, the Honorable Melanie Ann Agoran. Please proceed with your testimony. Good afternoon, Chairman Schatz, Vice Chair Murkowski, members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony on an important legislat legislative proposal before your committee and for your continued support for the Department and the Indian Health Service. It's efforts to improve the health and well-being of American Indians and Alaska Natives. I am Melanie Annie Gorin, the Assistant Secretary for Legislation at the Department of Health and Human Services, and it's my pleasure to join the committee again as we work together to combat the public health challenges in tribal communities. The Department and IHS agree that the increase in injuries and zoonotic diseases spread by animals in Indian Country represent a significant public health issue for tribal members in these rural communities. In recent years, free-roaming domestic animals have contributed to rabies outbreaks in tribal lands, human deaths due to zoonotic diseases, and severe injury and death due to mauling. The department is working as a whole through diverse offices and mission areas to address the public health concerns related to zoonotic diseases, including but not limited to rabies. The IHS already coordinates with and assists tribes in animal population control efforts to the extent practicable but within its authorities. Additionally, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the Commission Corps of the United States Public Health Service help to lead the department's efforts on the national surveillance of and education about rabies and other zoonotic diseases. While it recognizes the importance of this emergent threat in Indian country, the IHS has to balance its limited resources to deliver direct services to its defined population while combating a number of unique public health challenges facing Indian, health, Indian country. The Biden-Harris administration has advocated for additional resources to combat these growing threats in Indian country and is committed to fighting to reduce health disparities impacting tribal members. The IHS has examined firsthand and heard directly from tribes, especially those in northern Alaska, 
about the real public health risks from high rates of dog bite injuries in tribal communities. Over the past five years, there have been over 200 patients hospitalized from dog bite injuries or attacks, and an additional 24,000 who received ambulatory services at IHS clinics. The Navajo, Alaska, Great Plains, and Phoenix areas have the highest rates of number of, do number of bite-related hospitalizations over the past five years. And we know that tribes are desperate for assistance in addressing the problems at its source. The IHS authorizing statute does not currently convey authority to carry out veterinary services. As IHS does not have this authority, there is no authority for a tribal health program to add veterinary services to its ISDEA agreement. Within their authority, the IHS, CDC, and USPHS collaborate in careful coordination with other tribal, federal, state, county, and external partners to reduce the risk of zoonotic disease spread in Indian country. The IHS Division of Environmental Health Services staff work on surveillance training and capacity building and have been involved for decades with novel vector-borne zoonotic diseases in Indian country. It also coordinates with outside partners to facilitate the delivery of spay, neuter, rape, and rabies clinics for domestic dogs and cats, and has worked with federal partners like USDA on zoonotic disease prevention and risk factor reduction projects. The CDC has conducted several surveillance evaluations to characterize the risk of rabies in tribal lands. In several high-risk tribal communities in the Southwest United States, rabies testing and reporting rates are up to, up to 15 times lower compared to their non-tribal adjacent communities, in part because tribal communities do not have their own rabies laboratories. The highest risk for rabies reintroduction lies in tribal lands where free roaming dog populations remain a major public health issue. For example, as the vice chair noted, the Navajo Nation is home to approximately 250,000 free roaming dogs and met, with many remaining unvaccinated against rabies. The Veterinary Services to Pro Improve Public Health in Rural Communities Act would work to com combat this public health crisis. The department shares the goals with the drafters to combat zoonotic disease spreading in IHS areas and ensure that tribal members throughout Indian country are protected with robust public health outbreak prevention. Like the bill's drafters, the department and IHS look at, are looking to improve the response to zoonotic related disease and improve the safety for tribal communities. That being said, the bill in its current form does not include any additional resources for the department to stand up a new program without compromising its efforts to provide direct care, address other longstanding inequities, or combat other emergent public health challenges in Indian country. We look forward to continuing to work with Congress on improving the health of tribal populations, including the issues related to this bill. As always, HHS welcomes the opportunity to provide technical assistance as requested by the committee and its members. Thank you again for this opportunity to testify, and I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Freihage. Please proceed with your testimony. Good afternoon, Chairman Schatz, Vice Chairman Murkowski, and members of the committee. My name is Jason Freihage. I am the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Management and the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs at the Department of the Interior. Thank you for the opportunity to present testimony on S-2783, Miccosukee Reserve Area Amendments Act, S-3406, Technical Corrections to the Northwestern New Mexico Rural Water Projects Act, Taos Pueblo Indian Water Rights Settlement Act and Amit Litigation Settlement Act and S-3857, Homo Indian Village Land Transfer Act. The department supports S-2783, S-3406, and S-3857. S-2783 would amend the Miccosukee Reserve Area Act by expanding the Miccosukee Reserve Area to include Osceola Camp, which is within the boundaries of Everglades National Park. The National Park Service currently authorizes management of the camp through a special use permit. S-2783 would guarantee the permanence and protection of the camp and eliminate the need for recurring permit approval. The bill would also authorize appropriations, not more than a total of $14 million, to safeguard camp structures from flooding events. The department supports S-2783. S-3406 would amend the Omnibus Public Land Management Act of 2009 and the Claims Resolution Act of 2010 to authorize funding for the Navajo Nation Water Resources Development Trust Fund, the Taos Pueblo Water Development Fund, and Amit Settlement Pueblos Fund amounts that would have accrued if the department had the authority to invest those funds upon appropriation. 
Four Indian Water Rights Settlements, the Taos Pueblo Indian Water Rights Settlement Act, the Amet Litigation Settlement Act, and the Duck Valley Settlement, and the Crow Tribe Water Rights Settlement Act of 2010, contain provisions that authorize an investment of monies into settlement trust fund accounts after their enforceability date. The enforceability date is effective when the Secretary finds that all conditions for the full effectiveness and enforceability of the settlement occurred and is published in the Federal Register. But the Northwestern New Mexico Rural Water Project Act, or Navajo Settlement, also allowed an investment of monies into the Navajo Nation's Resources Development Trust Fund only upon a specified date certain 10 years after the enactment date. These provisions prohibited the department from investing trust fund monies before the enforceability date or a date certain. But the department mistakenly invested trust fund monies when they were appropriated and before the enforceability date. When the department discovered this error, the department's solicitor's office determined that the amounts earned prior to the date that the funds were authorized to be invested conflicted with the Anti-Deficiency Act and those funds must be returned to the Treasury. Soon after, the department then returned all interest monies accrued prior to the authorized date back to Treasury. The provisions contained in the five water settlements that prohibit the investment until the enforceability date or a date certain is reached are not common in Indian water rights settlements. The department supports S3406 to put those water settlements on par with other Indian water rights settlements. S3857 would place approximately 172.1 acres of land located in San Diego, California, into trust for the benefit of the Hamul Indian Village. The bill makes the lands that are owned in fee by the tribe part of the reservation for the Hamul Indian Village and includes a prohibition against Class II and Class III gaming under the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act. The parcels to be transferred into trust are Daisy Drive, which is the main access road into the tribe's existing trust land, a parcel that contains a culturally significant church and cemetery, and two parcels that the tribe plans to use for housing development, a clinic, and an administration building. The department supports S3857. The restoration of tribal homelands continues to be a priority for the department and Biden administration. Chairman Schatz, Vice Chair Murkowski, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to provide the department's views. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll now recognize uh, the Honorable Talbert Cypress, the chairman of the Muscogee Tribe, of Indians in Miami, Florida. All right, slight correction, Miccosukee tribe. Um, good afternoon, Chair Schatz and Vice Chair Mikowski and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to appear virtually before you today. I'm Talbot Cypress, Chairman of the Miccosukee tribe of Indians of Florida, a federally recognized tribe located in the greater Everglades in South Florida. Uh, the views expressed herein are those of the Miccosukee tribe. I appreciate the opportunity to discuss S-2783, the Miccosukee Reserved Area Amendments Act, which would expand the current boundaries of the Miccosukee Reserved Area to include the Osceola camp. Thank you also to Senator Scott and Senator Rubio for sponsoring this legislation. We strongly support S-2783, which would ensure appropriate governance for the Osceola camp and authorize funding to elevate structures in the camp to protect it from artificially engineered floodwaters from the Central Everglades Planning Project. The Miccosukee tribe was federally recognized in 1962. And after that recognition, our villages within Everglades National Park were managed as a special use permit granted by the National Park Service from 1964 to 1998. In 1998, Congress passed the Miccosukee Reserve Area Act. The concept for this act was to provide a legal framework under which members of the tribe can live permanently and govern their own affairs in the villages set aside for the tribe's use within the park. The Miccosukee Reserve Area Act of 98 has been a resounding success for the tribe and for Everglades National Park. Our residential community has been protected and right to self-government vindicated. The National Park, its waters and its visitor access have been well protected. However, there remains one special use permit within Everglades National Park which still facilitates the occupancy of an outlying village. This is my father's village called the Osceola camp. After descendants of war leader Osceola, who was executed by a flag of troops during the Second Seminole War. My ancestors lived in the Osceola camp for generations, but the camp continues to be subject to a special use permit renewal by Everglades National Park. 
The bill under consideration today would finally complete the protection of the tribal communities remaining within Everglades National Park. Sorry, I truly appreciate the opportunity to address this committee. And thank you for your support. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We really appreciate it. We'll now recognize the Honorable Erica Pinto, the chairwoman of the Hamul Indian Village of California. Uh, welcome. Thank you, and good afternoon, Chairman Schatz, Vice Chair Murkowski, and distinguished members of the committee. My name is Erica Pinto, and I have the honor to serve as chairwoman of the Hamul Indian Village of California. My mother is Carlene Chamberlain, and my father is Jesse Pinto Sr. I'd like to acknowledge our team in the room, the Hamul Council, also Carrie and Craig, and all the Hamul tribal members who are watching. And I thank all those who came before us. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on S3857, the Hamul Indian Village Land Transfer Act. I've submitted written testimony that discusses my tribe's history, our perseverance, and our need for additional trust lands. I plan to focus my remarks this afternoon on our vital need for trust lands to ensure access to our reservation, to protect our cemetery and church, and to return my people to our ancestral homeland. My ancestors were a band of Kumeyaay Indians known as the Hamul Band. Our people have continuously resided on a portion of our Aboriginal territory in Southern California since long before the arrival of the Spanish. For generations, we were without an officially declared land base until the Catholic diocese received a grant of our ancestral cemetery for the purpose of an Indian graveyard. The cemetery is the final resting place for nearly all of our relatives and ancestors dating back to the 1800s. The diocese later built a small church on the land in the early 1900s and allowed us to reside together, remain close to each other, near our ancestors and practice our culture and traditions. Our commitment to remain there despite the poor living conditions and attempts to move us speaks to our love dedication and connection to this cemetery and the surrounding lands. In the 1970s, the Secretary of the Interior initially took 4.6 acres into trust to establish our reservation. Until the early 80s, the people lacked basic utilities like running water and electricity. Living conditions for our people were deplorable. One shallow well supplied contaminated drinking water for our members. Our housing was primarily small shacks made up of scrap materials and dilapidated trailers. We did without basic amenities in order to remain on our ancestral lands near our cemetery to protect our way of life. The Department of Interior last exercised its authority to accept land into trust for our tribe in 1982 when it approved a 1.3 acre fee to trust transfer. Over time, our ancestral lands have diminished from over 640 acres to only six acres, which now comprises our entire land base, one of the smallest reservations in the nation. Since the tribe's lands were accepted into trust, we have done our very best to maximize the use of our land. In 2005, we made the extremely difficult decision to move off the reservation with the dream of a better life, of becoming self-sufficient, and not relying on the federal government. We wanted to be able to provide much needed services to our members. However, the relocation from our ancestral lands resulted in a significant loss of culture, language, community, and even life, since we have been unable to reside together and care for one another. S3857 accepts these parcels of land into trust for the tribe's benefit. The land is located within our ancestral territory in rural San Diego County. And since this bill prohibits gaming, it's important for this committee to know that the tribe cannot use these lands for gaming purposes once accepted into trust. The bill protects access to our reservation, preserves our ancestral cemetery and church, protects our sacred sites, and it allows us to bring our people home once and for all. In addition to tribal housing, we plan to build a healthcare facility a tribal administration building, a cultural center, a park, a police station, and a commercial kitchen to serve our members' traditional foods. Bringing back our members together 
and providing them with access to our cultural sites, access to our traditional foods and improved services and resources is not only something our people have longed for, it is vital to ensure our continued existence, to exercise self-determination and most importantly, exercise our tribal sovereignty. Thank you again to the committee for holding this hearing and for your consideration of S3857, the Hamul Indian Village Land Transfer Act. On behalf of my tribe, I'd like to thank Senators Padilla and Butler for their sponsorship of this legislation and for their hard work and commitment to Indian country. With that, I'm happy to answer any questions the committee may have. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. And now we'll recognize our final witness, Mr. Brian Lefferts, the Director of Public Health at the Yukon Kuskokwim Health Corporation in Bethel, Alaska. Hi, good afternoon. <clears throat> My name is Commander Brian Lefferts with the U.S. Public Health Service, and I'm here today on behalf of the Yukon Kuskokwim Health Corporation, YKHC, where I've worked for the past 18 years. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. YKHC is a tribal health organization of 58 federally recognized Alaska Native tribes, which was formed to administer a comprehensive healthcare delivery system for the communities of the YK region in southwestern Alaska. For more than 30 years, we've provided health care services to the people of the region under the Self-Governance Compact with the Indian Health Service under Title V of the Indian Self-Determination Act. YKHC serves a remote, isolated service area approximately the size of the state of Oregon. This region is the traditional home to Alaska's indigenous Yupik, Chupik, and Athabascan people and is not connected to the road system. As of the 2010 census, 89% of the residents are Alaska Native and around half the population speaks Yupik or Chupik language at home. YKHC provides a variety of community, social, and population health services to approximately 30,000 residents in the region. Our health system includes 41 village clinics, five sub-regional clinics, a regional hospital, and other regional services and programs. Alaska Native people in the region suffer dramatic health disparities compared to communities on the road system. Approximately a third of the homes in the region lack indoor plumbing, and we experience the highest household crowding rates in the United States. The life expectancy of people in the region is 69 years, 10 years less than the U.S. average. This decreased life expectancy is driven by elevated cancer incidents, increased prevalence of chronic heart, lung, and liver diseases, high rates of infectious diseases, and high levels of intentional and unintentional injuries, including dog bites. Veterinary Services to Improve Public Health in Rural Communities <clears throat> Act, which seeks to modify the Indian Health Care Improvement Act to include veterinary care, is vital to the health and well-being of Alaska Native communities. Indigenous people have a unique relationship with the land and animals. For thousands of years, the relationship was critical for survival and has become a basis of many cultural traditions and their identity as a people. This is especially true in the yukon Kuskokwim region where subsistence diets still account for the majority of the foods consumed and individual and community health are linked to the health of the wildlife in the region. Changes to the types of disease and illness affecting animals in the region is creating new threats to humans that were not historically a concern. For example, we've seen an emergence of brucellosis in caribou and walrus populations and distemper outbreaks in seal populations. These animals provide critical food sources for our communities. There's also been a recent detection of high path avian influenza and wild birds, and there's evidence that these have jumped to some wild mammals in Alaska. As far back as 2005, YKHC's worked with the Fish and Wildlife and tribes in the region to provide high path avian influenza surveillance and monitoring and hunter education as a part of a Be Prepared Not Scared campaign to help ensure that people can continue to participate in subsistence in a safe and healthy way. These are only a couple examples that show how having a dedicated YKHC staff to investigate zoonotic illness outbreaks and communi <clears throat> communicate health risks is critical to protecting human health in the region. Rabies is the most pressing of these zoonotic illnesses in the region and proposes a significant threat to public health. Rabies is transmitted through bites or contact with infected animals. It's considered enzoonotic through northern and western Alaska where it's always present among fox in the area. Occasionally, we have cases where humans are attacked by a rabid fox or wolf, but the greatest risk to human comes from dogs who've been bitten by an affected fox. The risk of being bitten by a dog in rural Alaska is higher than in other areas due to the prevalence of rabies and the large number of stray and unwanted pets that occur <clears throat> in areas without sufficient spay and neuter services. YKHC's Environmental Health Services team works with local health aides and medical providers to identify cases of animal bites. In a typical year, there's over 100 dog bite investigations to ensure rabies transmission does not incur and to determine if post-exposure prophylaxis is necessary. 
which is recommended in about 20% of the cases. Not only are bites a risk for rabies, but the attack themselves can lead to serious adverse health outcomes or death. We believe this legislation will reduce the incidence of preventable injuries and illness among the people in the region. In 2008, a joint strategic framework meeting involving the American Medical Association and the American Veterinary Medical Association and other major health groups coined the term One Health. It was adopted to refer to the interdependence of human, animal, and environmental health. This modern holistic approach aligns with longstanding indigenous understanding that our connectedness to the land and animals are essential to improving not only physical health, but also mental, behavioral, emotional, cultural, and spiritual well-being. This legislation will support the One Health vision and improve health outcomes for our communities by enhancing our ability to address zoonotic diseases and by recognizing veterinary services are a critical function to improve the health status of Alaska Natives. We're excited by this legislative effort and believe it will significantly enhance our ability to ensure the well-being of our people in a culturally relevant way. Koyana for the opportunity and honor to provide testimony today. Uh, th thanks to all of our witnesses. Um, I want to start with Assistant Secretary Egorin. Egorin? Egorin. Egorin, thank you. Uh, the committee submitted questions for the record for hearings we held uh, last December, which was an oversight hearing, and then in February, which was a legislative hearing. What is the status for receiving responses to these questions for the record? Senator, we are in the final stages of clearance of the questions for the record. We, as we noted with your staff yesterday, we hope to have them by the end of the month. And I do recognize that this is a delayed timeline um, and have personally asked to make sure that they are expedited. Is there somebody we should be talking to to emphasize that it's pretty difficult to do oversight if it takes nine months to get an answer to a question? Senator, I am the right person to express that. And uh, as I've said to my team and to many of your colleagues, please feel free to reach out to me. If you are not getting a response, please feel free to highlight this and I will shake trees and pound fists to move things along. Okay. I mean, what happened? It, there, I, There is a clearance process and that that your committee is one of multiple with questions for the record that must go through a process of drafting and clearance. Um, we are a small and mighty team, and it is really just a process of working through this along with the other functions that the Assistant Secretary for Legislation's office is responsible for. Okay. Um, I don't want to steal my vice chair's thunder on the veterinary services thing, but I want to get some clarity here. It seems like you're saying two things about veterinary services. In the beginning of your testimony, you seem to say essentially that there's a balance to be struck in terms of the deployment of resources. Am I getting that part right? There is there is a balance to be struck. Okay. And then the second thing is like you need an authorization. So I'm trying to figure out whether you're permitted to provide these services, but you just don't have the money. And so you want an authorization and then an appropriation. Like, is this a legal question or is this just a, we can't do everything and we're having to triage this thing. Those are, those really are two different questions. They are two different questions. And as I said, the department supports the intent of this legislation. The challenge is right now we do not have the legal authority to provide veterinary services. And therefore for tribes looking for ISDEA agreements, we cannot authorize those services. But at the same time, IHS has very limited resources. And so to add this to the list of services, would then put pressure on other areas. Okay. So them. you're saying you have a legal impediment and a fiscal one? Yes. Okay, got it. And could IHS offer these services um, through 638? No, right now we are prohibited from offering these services. Okay, okay. Uh, Chairwoman uh, Pinto, um, besides much needed housing for your tribal members, what other activities does the tribe plan on um, the land to be placed into trust, and why is it so important uh, to, to place that land into trust? Thank you for the question, uh, Chair Schatz. It's important for us because we've been without a community for the last 20 plus years. Um, we plan on bringing, in addition to the homes, much needed homes, uh, we have a commercial space there where we can bring a grocery store, retail space, a museum, a tribal uh, a tribal police station. Um, I'm really looking forward to a commercial kitchen because without our indigenous foods or traditional foods, 
uh, it's hard to be a healthy person and get into these healthy habits. It's so easy to go to McDonald's. So um, I plan on bringing those kind of amenities for the members, but also for the community at large in Hamul. Thank you very much. Uh, Chairman Talbert, can you describe how the Park Service's ecosystem restoration work being done in the, Ever in the Everglades has impacted the camp? Sure. Um, right now, what's going on is they are raising the uh, Tamiami Trail. Um, they are bridging it so that water can flow through uh, uh, more consistently. Um, and it would flow into the Southern Everglades. And the camp is, situa is situated right in the flowway. So um, the authorization of this bill would include funding to help raise the structures in the camp. Um, in order to protect the, the people that live there and also to help facilitate uh, Everglades restoration. And just so I'm getting the sort of context here, are, would you characterize your uh, relationship with the Park Service as reasonably collaborative? Yes, um, we've been reasonably collaborative. Uh, they, they, they meet with uh, the members of the camp there um, uh, independently without the tribes. Uh, presence, um, the traffic government's presence. But we also uh, we also meet with them together as well. So it's a very uh, strong effort um, in order to see this project through. Thank you. Mr. Fryhagi, um, since they're, they're not described in the bill, what are the, quote, appropriate actions that the Secretary of Interior um, can take to protect the camp? I'm sorry. As the chairman noted, uh, because the water levels will be raised, it's necessary to elevate the land and some of the structures so they're not flooded. And the work would also include reestablishing roadways and driveways to the camp, in addition to replacing the utilities across the site. Thank you. Vice Chair Murkowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I, I just want to go back to, to you, uh, Assistant Secretary Igorin. Um, You've, you've made clear in response to the chairman that uh, currently IHS um, does not have the authorization. Um, so you, you do not have the legal authority to include the veterinary services, specifically spay and, and neuter services in an ISDEA contract or compact. That's correct, correct? That is correct. Okay, so that is correct. And so that is why, I mean, this is a question, is that why then um, IHS had previously denied the request uh, by by both, um, well, there were two tribal health organizations in Alaska, YKHC and Manilek, uh, when they sought to add veterinary spay and neuter services to their self-governance funding agreements because they lack the authority. Senator, that is correct. Okay, and so this bill will fix that legal authority, is that correct? That is correct. And, and then I, I, I get what you have said about, um, about balancing limited resources, we understand that, but we also know that you've gotta have the legal authority first, so that's what we're trying to do here. To what extent is IHS assisting tribes right now with spay and neutering services. Um, are you doing anything at all? Uh, thank you for that question, Senator. I just really looks at this issue through the lens of public health and what they do right now with tribes is working through community education, messaging and coordination and providing support for partners, including tribes. So for you're doing that. What, what is your funding source for that public education then? That comes from as part of our larger public health messaging and public health work. Okay. Um, all right. It, based on, on your extensive testimony, which I appreciate, it sounds like you would agree that an authorization to IHS to support spay and neutering under ISDE agreements is going to help as we're dealing with these dog populations that, um, that are are real problems, whether it's in Navajo Nation or, or in Alaska. Um, the Senator, this legislation would allow um, ISDEA agreements to include these services. And if that is what a tribe would like to include in an agreement, it would allow us to 
work with them. So we, 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 we can talk about the funding aspect of it, um, but you've also raised another question or uh, another um, uh, concern in recognizing that we don't have rabies testing that is that are out in these areas. So whether it's in northern Alaska or uh, or in parts of, of Indian country, to what extent is IHS actually collecting data then on the dog bites and the rabies exposures? I mean, you've listed the, the you said 24,000 um, ambulatory cases. So you are obviously making some level of accounting. Where are the gaps in that? And um, uh, the, the one one health um, framework that uh, that uh, Commander Lefferts mentioned, to what extent are you working, is IHS working with um, CDC interagency on, on an initiative that does this kind of monitoring? Um, thank you for recognizing the work that Centers for Disease Control and Prevention does. They are the public health surveillance um, operation within HHS, and they work closely with IHS, as well as with state and local partners to monitor not just rabies, but other public health concerns. Um, and it is their data that showed that there was a 15% or 15 times lower testing rate in tribal communities than communities around them. They're working with tribal partners. There are limitations within IHS and within the capacities of their facilities, um, but continue to work with state, local, and other partners to make sure that we are doing surveillance the best we can with the current authorities. So, so let me ask uh, Commander Lefferts, um, when, when, when we think about the impact of a, of a dog bite, um, you think, okay, trauma to the child, the family, it's scary, but when you are in a, a rural community, and you don't have the ability to do the testing there. Um, more often than not, it's going to require a a, a trip um, either from the village to to Bethel or a trip into to Anchorage. Um, you may have hospitalization costs. Can you speak to um, just really the, the 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 cost? And I, I hate to to try to equate it to just dollars. But the assistant secretary here has, has said, we're balancing, we're balancing resources here. But if in fact um, uh, you've got costs that could average, as I understand, around $20,000 per person plus lost wages, travel costs if, if folks have to fly, you know, that's also, that's also a balancing factor because um, if that individual is being treated through IHS facilities. So, Commander Lefferts, can you just speak to that aspect of, of what rabies treatments in rural Alaska really really means? We'll just ask, um, yes, uh, just ask, those of you who are on the Zoom, there's a squeaking noise, so if you could mute yourself if you're not talking, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator, for the question. <clears throat> yes, um, each time um, a, a, someone's bitten by a dog, uh, somebody from the Office of Environmental Health at YKHC works uh, with people locally to try to identify um, if that dog was <clears throat> um, had been vaccinated uh, previously and if they can put it under quarantine. Uh, oftentimes, we're unable to locate the dog or we send it off for testing and it has um, it is positive for rabies, in which case we'll have to offer post exposure prophylactic treatment to um, anyone who come into contact with that. Can I um, can I interrupt that's... you right there, Commander? When you send the when you send this off for testing, how long does it take to turn that around? Because I'm assuming your testing lab is in Anchorage. Yeah, we send it to the virology lab in Fairbanks. So um, it could take a couple of days uh, to get the the animal there, and then. Um, <clears throat> they usually uh, prioritize these tests and we can have results um, okay. um, within another day of receiving it or so. Okay. Okay. And, and so you, you have the cost associated with the actual testing, but the, the cost to the individual, again, for treatment is not cheap. No. Uh, <clears throat> and then, um, so this is, yeah, uh, 
it's a series of treatments as well. So we have to treat the individual. The first treatments often comes with flying them into Bethel, um, which is, as you mentioned, very expensive. The treatment itself is several thousand dollars. And then um, it, it's a series of treatments that has to be done after that. If there's no local health aid, that patient would then need to be flown back to Bethel for multiple treatments. Um, this can be uh, <clears throat> quite burdensome on the family. If it's a child, they'll need to have a, um, an adult accompany them on the trip, and that creates additional um, <clears throat> additional burdens on the family who has uh, one of the caregivers away from the away from the community um, the whole time they're accompanying the child for to Bethel for treatment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm out of time. Here. Thank you very much to our testifiers. If there are no more questions for our witnesses, members may also submit follow-up written questions for the record. The hearing record will remain open for two weeks, and I want to thank all of the witnesses for their time and their testimony. This hearing is adjourned.